this loss would have been severe and irreparable. It would have destroyed the future resources of the nation without producing any other advantage than placing the emperor in a position to treat and obtain stipulations favorable to his interests. But Napoleon had renounced sovereignty. He only wanted a tranquil asylum. He abhorred the thought of seeing all his friends perish to attain so trifling a result. He was equally averse to become the pretext for the provinces being ravaged. And above all, he did not wish to deprive the National Party of its truest supports, which would sooner or later reestablish the honor and independence of France. Napoleon's only wish was to live as a private individual in the future. America was the most proper place, and that of his choice. But even England, with its positive laws, might also answer. And it appeared from the nature of my first interview with Captain Maitland that the latter was empowered to convey the emperor and his suite to England to be equitably treated. From this moment, we were under the protection of British laws, and the people of England were too fond of glory to lose an opportunity which thus presented itself, and that ought to have formed the proudest page of their history. It was therefore resolved to surrender to the English cruisers as soon as Captain Maitland should positively declare his orders to receive us. On renewing the negotiation, he clearly stated that he had the authority of his government to receive the emperor if he would come on board the Bellerophon and to convey him as well as his suite to England. Napoleon went on board, not that he was constrained to it by events, since he could have remained in France, but because he wished to live as a private individual would no longer meddle with public affairs and had determined not to embroil those of France. He would most assuredly not have adopted this plan had he suspected the unworthy treatment which was preparing for him, as everybody will readily feel convinced. His letter to the Prince Regent fully explains his confidence and persuasion on the subject. Captain Maitland, to whom it was officially communicated, before the emperor embarked on board his ship, having made no remarks on the above document, had, by this circumstance alone, recognized and sanctioned the sentiments it contained. 23rd. Saw you shan't at four in the morning, having passed it in the night. From the moment of approaching the channel, ships of the line and frigates were seen sailing in various directions. The coast of England was discovered towards evening. The 24th, we anchored it to our bay about 8 in the morning. The emperor had risen at 6 and went on the poop. Whence he surveyed the coast in anchorage, I remained by his side to give the explanations he required. Captain Maitland immediately dispatched a messenger to Lord Keith, the commander-in-chief at Plymouth. General Corgau rejoined us. He had been obliged to give up the letter for the prince regent. He had not only been refused permission to land, but prohibited from all communication. This was a bad omen, and the first indication of those numberless tribulations which followed. No sooner had it transpired than the emperor was on board the Bellerophon, than the bay was covered with vessels and boats full of people. The owner of a beautiful country seat in sight of the ship sent his majesty a present of various fruits. The 25th, the concourse of boats and crowds of spectators continued without intermission. The emperor saw them from the cabin windows and occasionally shooed himself on deck. On returning from the shore, Captain Maitland handed me a letter from Lady C, enclosing an other from my wife. My surprise was extreme and not less than my satisfaction, but the former ceased when I reflected that the length of the passage had given the French papers time to transmit an account of what had occurred to a considerable distance. So, that whatever related to the emperor and his suite was already known in England, where we had even been expected for five or six days before. My wife hastened to address Lady C on the subject, and the latter wrote to Captain Maitland, to whom she enclosed my letters without knowing him. My wife's letter bespoke feelings of tender affliction, but that of Lady C, who, from being in London, had heard our future destiny, was full of reproaches. I was not my own master, thus to dispose of myself. It was a crime to abandon my wife and children, ETC. 
melancholy result of our modern systems of education, which tends so little to elevate our minds that we cannot conceive either the merit or charm of heroic resolutions and sacrifices. We think all has been said and every plea justified when the danger of private interests and domestic enjoyments is put forward. Little imagining that the first duty towards the wife is to place her in a situation of honor and that the richest inheritance we can leave our children is the example of some virtues and a name to which a little true glory is attached. The 26th. Orders had arrived in the night for the ship to repair immediately to Plymouth. Having sailed in an early hour, we reached our new destination at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 10 days after our departure from Rochefort. 27. After quitting Paris and 35 from the Emperor's abdication, our horizon became greatly overcast from this day. Armed boats were placed round this ship. Those whom curiosity had attracted were driven away, even by firing musketry at them. Lord Keith, who was in the bay, did not come on board. Two frigates made the signal for sailing immediately. We were told that a courier extraordinary had brought dispatches for a distant quarter in the morning. Some of our party were distributed amongst other vessels. Every visage seemed now to look at us. With a sullen interest, the most sinister reports had reached the ship. Several destinations were mentioned, each more frightful than the other. Imprisonment in the Tower of London was the least terrific, and some spoke of St. Helena. Meanwhile, the two frigates, which had greatly excited my attention, got underway. Though the wind was contrary for leaving the roadstead, stood towards us and anchored on each side, nearly touching the bell riffin. Upon this, some person whispered to me that these ships were to receive us in the course of the night and sail for St. Helena. Never can I portray the effect of these terrible words. A cold sweat overspread my whole frame. It was an unexpected sentence of death unpitying executioners had seized me. I was torn from all that attached me to life. I extended my arms sorrowfully towards those who were dear to me, but in vain. My fight was, my fate was inevitable. This thought, together with the crowd of others, which arose in equal disorder, excited a real tempest of the mind. It was like the struggle of a soul that sought to disengage itself from its early Hab its earthly habitation. It turned my hair gray. Fortunately, the crisis was short, and as it happened, the mind came forth triumphant. So much so, indeed, that from this moment I seemed above the world. I felt that I could thenceforth defy injustice, ill treatment, and sufferings. Above all, I vowed that neither complaints nor solicitation should escape me. But let not those of my companions to whom I appear tranquil in those fatal circumstances accuse me of being deficient in feeling. Their agony was prolonged in detail. Mine operated all at once. One of those circumstances, which is not the least extraordinary of my life, occurred to my thought soon after, 20 years before and during my emigration to England without possessing any worldly goods. I had refused to seek a certain fortune in India because it was too remote, and I thought myself too old. Now, when 20 years older, I was about to quit my family, friends, fortune, and enjoyments to become a voluntary exile 2,000 miles off in the midst of the ocean for nothing. But no, I am mistaken. The sentiment that now impelled me was infinitely superior to the riches I then disdained. I followed him who had governed the world and will occupy the attention of posterity. The emperor continued to appear on deck as usual. I sometimes saw him in his cabin, but without communicating what I had heard, I wished to console him and not to be his tormentor. The reports had, however, reached him, but he had come so freely and confidently on board the Belrefin. He had been so strongly invited by the English themselves. He so completely regarded his letter to the Prince Regent transmitted beforehand to Captain Maitland as so many tacit conditions. He had, in fact, acted with such magnanimity through the proceeding that he repelled with indignation all the fears which were attempted to be excited in him and even permitting those around him to entertain doubts. The 27th and 28th, it would be difficult to describe our torments and anxiety at this moment. Most of us were dumb. Inanimate, 
the least circumstance which transpired from this shore an opinion, however unimportant, expressed on board. An unmeaning paragraph in a daily paper became the subjects of our most serious arguments and the cause of perpetual oscillations between our hopes and fears. The most trifling reports were sought with avidity. Whoever appeared was urged to give a favorable version of the deceitful anticipations. So little to the ardor and activity of our national character contribute to endow us with that stoical resignation and imperturbable compulsion, which can only be acquired from settled principles and positive doctrines imbibed from early infancy. The public papers, particularly those of the ministerial side, were let loose against us. It was the outcry of the ministers preparing the blow they were about to strike. They would not be easy to form an idea of the horrors, falsehoods, and imprecations accumulated on our heads. And there is always a portion communicated to the multitude, however well disposed it may be, so that the demeanor of those around us became less easy, while their politeness became embarrassed and their countenances reserved. Lord Keith, after announcing himself for some time before, had only just made his appearance. It was evident that our company was shunned. Our conversations avoided. The papers contained an account of the measures which were about to be taken, but as nothing official had appeared and there was some contradiction in the details, we were induced to flatter ourselves as to the final result, thus remaining in that state of suspense and uncertainty, which is worse than a knowledge of the most painful truths. Nevertheless, our arrival in England had produced a singular sensation. The presence of the emperor excited a curiosity bordering on delirium. It was the papers themselves that informed us of the circumstance while they condemned it. All England seemed to hurry towards Plymouth. A person who had left London on hearing of my arrival was obliged to stop on the road for want of post, horses, and accommodation. The sound was covered with an immense number of boats, for some of which we heard above 50 pounds had been paid. The emperor to whom I read all the newspapers did not betray any decrease of composure, either by his conversation or general habits. It was known that he always appeared on deck towards five o'clock. A short time before this hour, all the boats collected alongside of each other. There were thousands and so closely connected that the water could no longer be seen between them. They looked more like a multitude assembled in a public square than anything else. When the emperor came out, the noise and gestures of so many people presented a most striking spectacle. It was at the same time very easy to perceive that nothing hostile was meant and that if curiosity had brought them, they felt interested on going away. We could even see that the latter sentiment continued to increase. At first, people merely looked towards the ship. They ended by saluting. Some remained uncovered and occasionally went so far as to cheer. In an hour, symbols began to appear amongst them. Several individuals of both sexes came decorated with red carnations. But this was only turned to our detriment in the eyes of the ministry and its partisans, so that it rendered our agony more poignant. It was under these circumstances that the emperor who notwithstanding his calm demeanor, could not help being struck by what he heard, dictated a paper to me worthy of serving as a model to jurists, discussing and defending his real political situation. We found means of conveying it on shore, but I have kept no copy. The 29th and the 30th, a report had circulated during two previous days that an undersecretary of state was coming from London to notify the resolution of the ministers with respect to the emperor officially. Accordingly, he appeared. It was Sir Charles Bunbury. He came on board, accompanied by Lord Keith, and delivered a dispatch ordering the removal of the Emperor to St. Helena and limiting the number of persons who were to accompany Napoleon to three, excluding, however, the Duke de Rivigo and General Lallemand, comprised in the list, list of prescribed. I was now called before the Emperor. The bearers of his sentence spoke and understood French. They were admitted alone. I have since heard that he objected and protested with no less energy than logic against the violence exercised on his person. He was the guest of England, said he, and not her prisoner. He came of his own accord to place himself under the protection of her laws. The most sacred rights of hospitality were violated in his person. He would never submit voluntarily to the outrage with which they threatened him. Violence alone should oblige him to, oblige him to do so, ETC. Emperor gave me the ministerial document to translate for him, of which the following is a copy. 
communication made by Lord Keith in the name of the English ministers. As it may perhaps be convenient for General Buonaparte to learn without farther delay the intentions of the British government with regard to him, your lordship will communicate the following information. It would be inconsistent with our duty towards our country and the allies of his majesty if General Buonaparte possessed the means of again disturbing the repose of Europe. It is on this account that it becomes absolutely necessary. He should be restrained in his personal liberty, so far as this is required by the foregoing important object. The island of St. Helena has been chosen as his future residence. Its climate is healthy, and its local position will allow of his being treated with more indulgence than could be admitted in any other spot owing to the indispensable precautions which it would be necessary to employ for the security of his person. General Bonaparte is allowed to select amongst those persons who accompany him to England, with the exception of General Savary and Lallemand, three officers, who together with his surgeon will have permission to accompany him to St. Helena. These individuals will not be allowed to quit the island without the sanction of the British government. Rear Admiral Sir George Cockburn, who is named Commander-in-Chief, at the Cape of Good Hope and seas adjacent will convey General Buonaparte and his suite to St. Helena, and he will receive detailed instructions relative to the execution of this service. Sergi Cockburn will most probably be ready to sail in a few days, for which reason it is desirable that General Buonaparte should make choice of the persons who are to accompany him without delay. Although we expected our transportation to St. Helena, we were deeply affected by its announcement. It threw us all into a state of consternation. The emperor did not, however, fail to appear on deck as usual with the same countenance, and as before, tranquilly surveyed the crowds, which seemed so eager to see him. 31st, our situation had now become truly frightful. Our sufferings beyond every power of description, our existence was about to cease with regard to Europe our country, families, and friends, as well as our enjoyments and habits. It is true we were not forced to follow the emperor, but our choice was that of martyrs. The question was a renunciation of faith or death. Another circumstance was added, which greatly increased our torments. This was the exclusion of General Savary and Lallemand, whom it struck with the utmost terror. They saw nothing but a scaffold before them and felt persuaded that the ministers of England, making no distinction between the political acts of a revolution and crimes committed in a moment of tranquility, would give them up to their enemies to be sacrificed. This would have been such an outrage on all law, such an opprobrium for England herself that one might have been almost tempted to dare her to do it. But it was only for those who were included in the same prescription to talk thus. At all events, we do not hesitate to desire that each of us might be amongst those whom the emperor would choose entering, entertaining but one fear, that of finding ourselves excluded. August 1st, we still continued in the same state. I received a letter from London in which it was strongly urged that I should be extremely wrong, nay, that it would be even be a crime to expatriate myself. The person who thus wrote also addressed Captain Maitland, begging he would assist by his efforts and counsel to dissuade me from such a resolution. But I stopped him short by observing that at my age, people generally act on reflection. I read the papers every day to the emperor, whether influenced by generosity or that opinions began to be divided. There were two amongst the number that pleaded our cause with great warmth compensating in some measure for the gross falsehoods and scurrilous abuse with which the others were filled. We gave ourselves up to the hope that the hatred inspired by an enemy would be succeeded by the interest which splendid actions ought naturally to excite that England abounded in noble hearts and elevated minds which would indubitably become our ardent advocates. The number of boats increased daily. Napoleon continued to appear at his usual hour, and the reception became more and more flattering. 
Numbers of every rank and condition had followed the emperor. He was still, with regard to most of us, as if at the Tuileries. The Grand Marshal and Duke de Rivigo alone saw him habitually. Some had not approached or spoken to him more frequently than if we had been in Paris. I was called during the day whenever there were any papers or letters to translate until the emperor insensibly contracted the habit of sending for me every evening towards eight o'clock to converse with him a short time in the conversation this evening and after touching on various other subjects he asked me whether i would accompany him to saint helena i replied with the greatest frankness rendered more easy by my real sentiments observing to his majesty that in quitting paris i had disregarded every chance and that therefore that of saint helena had nothing which could make it an exception there were however a great many of us round his person while only three were permitted to go out as some people considered a crime in me to leave my family, it was necessary with regard to the latter and my own conscience to know that I could be useful and agreeable to him, that, in fact, I required to be chosen, but that this last observation did not spring from any concealed motive, for my life was henceforward at his disposal without any restriction." While thus engaged, Madame Bertrand, without having been called, and even without announcing her name, rushed into the cabin, and in a frantic manner entreated the emperor not to go to St. Helena, nor to take her husband with him. But observing the astonishment, coolness, and calm answer of Napoleon, she ran out as precipitately as she had entered. The emperor, still surprised, turned to me and said, Can you comprehend all this? Is she not mad? In a moment after, loud shrieks were heard, and everybody seemed to be running towards the stern of the ship. Being desired to ring the bell and to inquire the cause, I found it was Madame Bertrand, who, on leaving the captain, had attempted to throw herself into the sea and was prevented with the greatest difficulty. From this scene, it is easy to judge our Felix. The second and third. In the morning of... The second and third, the Duke de Rivigo told me I was certainly to depart for St. Helena, which in conversation with the emperor a short time before his majesty had said to him that if there were only two to accompany him, I should still be one of the number as he thought I could afford him some consolation. I am indebted to the candor and kindness of the Duke for the satisfaction of being made acquainted with this flattering assurance. And I'm truly grateful, as but for him, it would never have been known to me. The emperor had not said a word in reply to my answer. This was his custom, as I shall have other opportunities of showing. I had no particular acquaintance with any of those who had followed the emperor, except General and Madame Bertrand, who had shown me great attention during my mission to Lyria where he was governor general. I had until then never spoken to the Duke de Rivigo, certain prepossessions having induced me to keep at a distance. We had, however, scarcely exchanged a few words when my scruples were completely removed. Severi was sincerely attached to the emperor. I knew he possessed warmth of heart, sincerity, and uprightness of character, qualities which rendered him susceptible of real friendship. We should therefore, I dare say, dare say, have become very intimate. May he one day read the expression of these sentiments he has inspired me with and the regret he has left me. I was again sent for by the emperor, who after alluding to different subjects began to speak of St. Helena, asking me what sort of a place it could be, whether it was possible to exist there, and similar questions. But, said he, after all, it is quite certain that I shall go there. Is a man dependent on others when he wishes that his dependence should cease? We continued to walk to and fro in his cabin. He seemed calm, though affected, and somewhat absent. My friend, continued the emperor, I have sometimes an idea of quitting you. And this would not be very difficult. It is only necessary to create a little mental excitement, and I shall soon have escaped. All will be over, and you can then quietly rejoin your families. This is more easy, since my internal principles do not impose any bar to it. I am one of those who conceive that the pains of the other world were only imagined as a counterpoise to those inadequate allurements which are offered to us there. God can never have willed such 
a contradiction to his infinite goodness, especially for an act of this kind. And what is it, after all, but wishing to return to him a little sooner? <laughs>